Thank you so much to Paula and the team for leading us so well this morning. That was absolutely beautiful. And uh, just another word of greeting to those watching us on the live stream. Esme de Klerk, you're not feeling well. She just watched at me before the service, but she's watching on the live stream. Kurt Rowitzki, I can see you there in New Zealand. You're watching as well. And uh, those from around the world. Folk, it's amazing that as we meet here uh, this morning, I want you to know that between 1,500 and 2,000 people watch this service online, either live or during the course of the week. It's just amazing how through technology we are connected with Christ followers all around the world. And so it's just a joy to be alive at this time in history. Well, we're again in the book of Acts, continuing with our Spirit Empowered People series and what an action-packed series it's been up to this point in time. Today, if you've got your Bible with you, let's turn to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to look at the famous conversion of the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. And of course, Paul went, to, went on to write 37 New Testament books. So radical was his conversion. John, if you can just give me a little bit more power on my mic here, that'll be great. Friends, what we're going to see with, with Paul is that Jesus doesn't do a half job. When he changes people, he radically changes, changes them. He completely transforms them. In fact, Saul is changed to such an extent that his name becomes Paul. And he goes on to write in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, completely transformed by the power of God. So with that in mind, let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 9 and read this incredible account of Saul of Tarsus' conversion. Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 1. Against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now remember, Christians were originally known as people of the way. And they got that title from the words that Jesus spoke in John 14 verse 6, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Christians were originally known as people of the way. But notice Jesus didn't say, I am one of a variety of ways. I'm one of a variety of ideologies or philosophies. He declared himself to be the way. And this was the point that the rubby at the road for Saul. He was opposed to this message and he went out of his way to um, destroy the people who spoke this word. Now friends, just a quick question before I carry on reading this morning. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the way? Somebody might say, well, no, I'm religious. Well, so was Saul, you'll discover. Someone says, no, but I'm a spiritual person, so was Saul. Someone says, no, but I'm committed, I'm zealous for good things, so was Saul. You see, friends, 2,000 years later, this is the fundamental question that challenges the secular world of 2020. This is where the rubber hits the road. Where do you stand when it comes to Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Let's continue reading. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days 
without sight and neither ate nor drank. What powerful, riveting verses. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for an opportunity this morning to once again sit under the teaching of your word. Yes, Lord, words written by men, but words inspired by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for each man and woman, boy and girl, either watching on the live stream or here in the church this morning. Lord, I pray that you would speak a powerful word of truth into their lives today. Lord, help us to see all over again our need for Jesus. Our need for Jesus Christ. Our need to have Him as our rock and as our foundation, as the very center of our lives. And then, Lord, the challenge to go beyond this building and to make that same Jesus known to others. So, Holy Spirit, we honor you as our teacher this morning. Come and cause these verses to come alive in our hearts and lives, we pray. In Jesus' great name, amen. Well, friends, just to share with you three powerful thoughts flowing from these verses. Number one, we see that Saul was a committed opponent of the Christian faith. He was a committed opponent of the Christian faith. In Acts chapter 7, if you backtrack a little bit, we read of a young man there called Stephen. Stephen was a deacon. He was a respected leader in the early church. On one occasion, Stephen shares his faith. He speaks about Jesus. People who are listening are enraged. They are furious. And in fact, the Bible says they gnash their teeth at him, just full of rage and anger. And then they publicly and brutally executed Stephen by stoning him to death. You can imagine the scene. This young, courageous Christ follower becomes the first martyr of the Christian faith. And then we read these troubling words in verse 58. They covered the ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at Stephen, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul was overseeing, was supervising this brutal murder in Acts chapter 7. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1 we read, And Saul approved of their killing him. So Saul's not shocked. He's not appalled by this mob justice, by this horrific murder. No, no, make no mistake about it. Saul wanted Stephen dead. And then in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, we read, But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them into prison. Can you imagine this scene? This angry, out-of-control man dragging men and women, moms and dads, from their homes and throwing them into prison. Can you imagine if something similar had to happen in our day and age? Listen to how in 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, Paul now converted looks back on his old life. This is how he describes himself. He says, I was once a blasphemer. Yeah, he's talking about himself. I was a persecutor. I was a violent man. Then we get to our text. Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, I want you to see that Saul's rage against these early followers of Jesus Christ at this point is totally out of control. This group of people who dared to claim that salvation is by grace through faith alone in Jesus, not of works, right standing with God, acceptance by God. These early fishermen and tax collectors were saying, it's by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus, there's nothing you can do to earn it or deserve it. You can only receive it. The question is, why was Saul so angry? Why was he so opposed to this message of grace? Well, let me tell you why. 
Because this message of grace challenged Saul to the very core of his being. It challenged his very identity. You see, Paul knew if this message was true, his whole life up to that point in time counted for absolutely nothing. In fact, late in Philippians, he says, my whole life up to that point in time, listen to this, amounted to a pile of garbage, uh, garbage, rubbish, or stinking manure. Friends, how many of you realize that's a shocking realization to come to? Maybe at this point in his life, he's close to 40 years old. He realizes my whole life, my education, my status, my identity, my achievements, everything I am up to this point in time is just one stinking pile of rubbish. That's a shocking realization to come to. Saul knew. If this teaching is correct, my whole life amounts to one big zero, and I don't want to be a zero. I don't want to be a zero. And so I'm going to oppose these people and their message with everything I've got, and that's exactly what he did. How many of you would agree right now that, humanly speaking, at this point, Saul is a very unlikely candidate for conversion? <laughs> a very unlikely candidate to author half of the New Testament Scriptures. He's too radical. He's too committed. He's too far gone. He knows what he believes, and no one is budging him. How could a man like that ever change? Do you know someone like that? Do you live with someone like that? Someone you've been praying for for years, but it seems they're too far gone, too messed up, too addicted, too broken, too rebellious, too set in their ways to change. Were you perhaps that person once upon a time? Friends, the whole point of Acts chapter 9 is, listen to this, the whole point of the story is no one is beyond the grace of God. Not a single human being is too far gone, too messed up, too rebellious, too addicted, too proud, that the redeeming power of God cannot penetrate that hard, rebellious heart and bring about transformation so that they become like Paul did a new creation. Never write yourself off. Never write anybody else off. They are just one encounter away from a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. I've got a friend who lives on the Turkish-Iranian border. His name is Mehmet. Nigel Raw will recognize his face, as will my dad. Mehmet is there with three of my friends on the Iranian border. That man, that Turkish man, about 15 years ago, when my dad was with me in the streets of this particular city, was an angry, violent man who threatened that day to take my life. That man right over there. He said, Mark, I will cut your head off, and I will send your body back to Africa in a body bag. He was raging. He was violent. Dad, you remember that day? In fact, my dad almost lost his sanctification. He said, you touch my son, I'll take your head off. (laughs) An angry, violent man. Friends, I want to tell you, that same man today, like Saul, has been revolutionized by the grace and the power of God. Mehmet is now hosting, as we host church here this morning, he's hosting a church in his home on the Iranian border. He loves Jesus, he loves people, transformed by the power of God, never write anybody off. The grace of God, the power of God is no respecter of people. Change Saul, change Mehmet, can change you as well. Well, second point we see from these verses is that Saul's conversion was sudden and unexpected. Have a look at verse 3. As he neared Damascus, suddenly, there's that word, a light from heaven flashed around him. It literally came out the blue suddenly and unexpectedly. In Galatians 1 verse 14, Paul is now saved, he's following Jesus, but he he speaks about his condition at this point in time. He says, 
I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Friends, I want you to know that in Paul's mind, or Saul as he was in those days, there was no obvious indication. There was no visible clue that his life was about to change. Turned upside down, inside out by Jesus. He was committed, he was advancing, he was zealous, but suddenly and unexpectedly, everything changes as God breaks in. I've got another friend. His name is Ali Pektash. Nigel will know this man. Ali Pektash, like Saul, was a committed religious man. Ali Pektash saved up every single Turkish lira he possessed to go on a hajj, a pilgrimage to Mecca in the heart of Saudi Arabia. In the middle of the night, in the middle of their pilgrimage, Jesus Christ met Ali Pektash face to face in a dream, and he touched his forehead, his forehead, and he said, Ali, I'm calling you, I'm calling you to follow me. Ali packed his bags. He left Mecca, Saudi Arabia. He returned to Turkey. He led his wife and his children to Jesus. Today, Ali Pektash pastors an amazing church in eastern Turkey. A life suddenly, unexpectedly, in the middle of the night, changed by the power of God. Friends, I don't know if there's someone you've been praying for, for a long time. And it seems like the more you've prayed, the worse things they've got. There are no signs, no clues that they're getting any closer to Jesus. But Saul shows us, Ali Pektash shows us that suddenly and unexpectedly, everything can change. Finally, we see that Saul's conversion was an act of sovereign grace. An act of sovereign grace. Don't you just love the way that without warning or without asking Saul for permission, Jesus just totally interrupts this man's life. (laughs) He didn't ask for permission. He just did what he wanted to do. And that's why I use the word there, sovereign. Saul wasn't seeking after Jesus, was he? He was opposed to Jesus. He wasn't asking questions. But boom, Jesus knocks him off his horse and he says, I'll take over from here, Saul. I've got plans for your life that you know nothing about. Acts 9 verse 15 will blow your mind. Acts 9 verse 15, this man, this murderous, blaspheming, violent man is my chosen instrument, God says, to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings, and to the people of Israel, doesn't that verse take your breath away? A murderous, violent, proud, religious man. God had plans for him. In Galatians 1 verse 15, Paul now, a follower of Jesus, explains the reason for his conversion. This is why it happened, he said. But when God, oh my goodness, listen to these words, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles. Are you seeing it? God chose Saul long before Saul ever thought of choosing God. In fact, Jesus says, I chose you, Saul, before the foundation of the world, before he was even born. Remember the words I spoke over this young lady's life, Jeremiah 1 verse 5? I want you this morning to put your name into that verse. Before I formed you, before I formed you, you, in the womb, I knew you. In other words, before the world knew you, God knew you. Before your parents even thought about having a child, you already existed in the mind of God. Why? I set you apart 
I appointed you, Jeremiah, to be a prophet to the nations. Friends, doesn't that just blow your mind? Doesn't it encourage you personally this morning? You've been chosen by God. Personally. Before the foundation of the world. And you've been created with a God-given dream and purpose on the inside of you. How does that change everyday life? Just going to work in the morning. To know that God has called you by name. God has set His love upon you. God has, before you even born, filled your heart with purpose and destiny. This is life-changing. Friends, Saul shows us that anybody, no matter how hard their heart may appear to be, is just a moment away from experiencing God's sovereign grace. A life-changing encounter with the living Jesus that will change them forever and lead them into a life of kingdom advancing, God-glorifying purpose. Somebody needs to hear that today. Somebody online watching this morning needs to hear that word. One encounter away. Not with religion. Not with, not with somebody's book of rules. One genuine encounter with the living, risen Jesus. And you will never be the same again. And you will be catapulted, like Saul was, into a life of purpose and God-glorifying destiny. Who would say no to that? Let us pray. Just as our heads are bowed and as we take a moment to reflect and think on that word. There must be somebody here this morning or maybe a group of people, certainly those watching online. You say, Mark, you know what? I can relate to Saul. Maybe I've been religious. Maybe I've been a spiritual person. Maybe I've been zealous and committed for good things. But I know in my heart of hearts, I've never truly met, encountered the living, risen Jesus. Friends, I believe that's why God brought you to this church this morning. I believe that's why you're watching this stream on your computer or your cell phone. Because today is the day that everything can change for you. Like it did for Mehmet, for Ali Pektash, for millions around the world. One encounter with Jesus. So maybe you want to pray this prayer with me this morning. Lord Jesus, this morning I recognize my spiritual bankruptcy. I recognize the emptiness in my life. I may have tried to fill that void with other things and other people. But Lord, they have never succeeded. Thank you for showing me this morning that I am a sinner by nature and by choice. And that I fall short of the glory of God. But Lord, thank you this morning for reminding me of amazing grace, unmerited favor. Thank you for reminding me of the redeeming power of Jesus Christ who reaches into broken lives and broken hearts and brings restoration and healing and forgiveness. And Lord, this morning, I need that from you. And so today, Lord Jesus Christ, I receive you into my heart, into my life. I recognize you as the Lord and the Savior of my soul. Lord, today I surrender my life to you. Hand over the reins of control to you. And Lord, from this day forward, I commit myself to living for the glory and honor of your great name. Won't you lead me forward? Won't you show me the purpose for my life? The dreams you have for me. And may I bring you glory and honor in the days and months and years ahead. 
Father, won't you seal that commitment to the hearts and lives of people? May it never be lost. May it never be forgotten. But may you fill them with your Holy Spirit even now as they sit or as they watch online. Holy Spirit, fill them to overflowing and lead them into the plans and purposes of God for their lives. Maybe God has challenged somebody else this morning. And said, you once encountered me in a real, authentic, genuine way. You once were living a life of purpose. And you once were making a difference. 